Shalom Hadavar Nix. Welcome to Hadavar Messianic Ministry School of Biblical and Jewish Studies. We're studying the Jewish life of the Messiah, the 2021 edition, and this is lesson 14 and session 47. So let's go ahead and review session 46. Now in session 46, we looked at the relationship between the death of Judas and the Hinnom Valley. This is the Hinnom Valley curving down around the south side of the city of Jerusalem. And then from the north comes down the Kidron Valley on the north uh, east. Uh, the Kidron Valley is a north-south valley on the eastern side of the, the city of Jerusalem. And the two meet there in the southern corner of Jerusalem. Now, the scriptures tell us that Judas hung himself in the city of Jerusalem. That means the city of Jerusalem was, was um, defiled for the Passover and the Chagigah, the Passover festival peace offering, cannot be offered. However, rabbinic tradition states that if the body was thrown into the Hinnom Valley, then the city was cleansed and the Chagigah could be offered. And so that's apparently what happened. Somebody found Judas's body and then they tossed, tossed it over the city wall down into the Hinnom Valley. When it, when it rolled down the hill or fell, hit the rocks at the bottom, his body split open and his intestines gushed out. So that harmonizes the two accounts of Judas's death. Now, the priests didn't know what to do with the 30 pieces of silver that they had uh, given to Judas to betray Yeshua. And so they decided that they would buy the potter's field with it. That was the only option they had left. They couldn't give the money back to Judas. Uh, he was dead. They couldn't use it in the temple because it was blood money. The only thing they could do with it was to use it for the public good. So that was the option open to them. They bought the potter's field as a burial ground for strangers. And of course, the first stranger was probably Judas. And there is the potter's field, uh, or what we think could be the potter's field today. Then we started looking forward to the Roman trials. And as a background to the Roman trials, we looked at the Roman requirements. Uh, first of all, the issue was sedition, sedition against Rome. <clears throat> The um, issue in the religious trials was blasphemy, but the issue in, uh, with Rome is sedition. Rome has a political concern. They don't want any insurrections. And we also saw that the proceedings had to be public, and that's exactly what Pilate will do, and the proceedings had to be based on a specific charge, uh, a charge brought by a prosecuting witness. <clears throat> so this brings us to the new material. Now, in your outline, we're in Lesson 14, page 9. That's an article about Pilate. So we'll pick it up on Lesson 14, page 10, at the top of the page of your outline, with Section 233, the first Roman phrase, phase, before Pilate. So we begin with Luke 23, verse 1. Then the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate. So this is the first trial, and again, Pilate is the, the magistrate. Now, this takes place in the Praetorium, which is probably the Antonio Fortress. Now, Pilate was a real human being. He was not a myth. And this is substantiated by archaeology because this tablet has been found at Caesarea mentioning Pilate. And there is his name right there, Pilatus. And here's another view of that, of that uh, tablet that's on display showing the name Pilatus. And this tablet provides the missing letters that were obscured or destroyed on the tablet. And there we can see it. Pontius Pilatus, Prefect Judea. Pontius Pilate was a very real human being. He was not a myth. So the uh, chief priests bring Yeshua from the western hill, the circle there on the left, bottom left corner. They bring him from the western hill down to the council chamber for their final trial. And now the final trial has been finished and they've taken Yeshua over to the, to the um, fortress of Antonio on the northwestern corner of the Temple Mount. And here's how the territory looks today, over to the council chamber or the possible council chamber, and then a little further north to this building. And in that building stands over the uh, ruins of the Antonio Fortress. It stands on the top of where the Antonio Fortress once was located. And here's another picture of the Antonio Fortress. There it is in the northwestern corner of Herod's Temple Mount. Now this is a picture of the 
Israel model, I should say the Jerusalem model in the Israel Museum. It used to be in the Holy Land Hotel, but now it's at the Israel Museum. It's a wonderful model. You have to go see it when you go to Israel. But of course, here is the Antonio Fortress. We're north of the fortress looking south. And then in the south, to the south, we can see the temple sticking up above the walls. And here's another picture. We're at east. We're facing east. Uh, we're facing west here. We're on the east side of the city, looking at the Antonio Fortress. And here's a close-up of that model. It makes you feel like you're right there, doesn't it? I feel like you're ready to walk those ramparts. Uh, there it is, the Antonio Fortress. Now this drawing is from the courtyard level. Now, somebody is in the courtyard of Herod's to uh, Herod's temple complex, and they're looking north. And they see the Antonio jutting up above the, the walls of the, of the temple uh, compound. And now we can, we can kind of estimate the, the um, route that the, the priests and Yeshua took when they uh, came to the Antonio Fortress. You can see my arrow is going along the, the curves and the warren of the old city. Then under the, um, the, uh, the building there, underneath the uh, Robinson's Arch, then underneath the Synagogue Arch, and finally we come to the stairway that leads up to the Antonio Fortress. So that could have been the route that Yeshua took along the, along the um, western wall of the uh, temple compound. And here as we come to the temple compound, uh, right down there in the bottom right corner, his uh, procession would, would enter the picture, come along the street, and then they could take a turn to the right and go up the stairs into the Antonio Fortress. So that's a possible route they could have taken Yeshua. Now we can walk that route thanks to this wonderful graphics provided by my GLOW program. I really enjoy that GLOW Bible program and wonderful graphics in it. But here we're standing uh, underneath Robinson's Arch and we'll, cons we'll start moving northward underneath Robinson's Arch beside the, the um, stores, the little store shops on the right hand side there and can keep on coming along the western wall, up the street, up the platform. Now in the distance you can see the Antonio uh, beginning to stand out against the horizon. And finally we arrive at the Antonio Fortress. So that's a possible route that could have been, that could have been taken. Now Pilate. Let's talk about Pilate. Pilate was born in Spain and he served as procurator from 26 to 36 AD. Oh, excuse me, I have one more picture to show you here. There is the uh, Antonio Fortress on the northwest corner of the Herodian Temple Mount. All right, now let's talk about Pontius Pilate. Now, Pilate was born in Spain, and he served as procurator from 26 to 36 AD. And this trial happens in the middle of his procuratorship in 30 AD. Now, Pilate was famous for his cruelty. So in the wee hours of the morning, Pilate is dressed and he's ready to conduct a trial. The reason? Earlier that night, Judas went before Pilate and presented the official charge by which the Roman cohort could be released for the arrest. And since Pilate had earlier released the Roman cohort to Judas, Judas should have been there for the trial itself. Pilate's ready for it. Yeshua is ready for it. The accused is there, but Judas the accuser is not. He has committed suicide. So let's pick it up in John's account, in John 18, 28. Then they led Yeshua from, the, from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter in the, into the praetorium so that they could not be defiled. They would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Now this term, the Passover, has caused confusion. There's confusion because the Passover apparently was eaten the night before. What is the term the Passover referring to if it's already been eaten? Well, remember, the Jewish day goes from sundown to sundown, not from sunup to sunup. Thursday night was the first night of Passover, and the Seder meal was eaten at that time. In the morning, there's a special sacrifice known as the Haggigah offering. The Haggigah is the official festival peace offering, the Passover festival peace offering. Is offered immediately after the regular morning sacrifice. The Haggikah is also known as the Passover. Now the priests partake of the Passover offering. Now the reason that they are afraid of eating this offering lies in the fact that they're facing a rabbinic ritual defilement, a tradition. According to tradition, 
They would be ritually defiled if they entered the home of a Gentile. The ritual defilement would end at sundown. However, in the situation before us here, they had to eat the Hagigah the same day it was offered. They also had to offer the Hagigah in a ritually pure state. In addition, they had to eat it in a ritually pure state. And they had to all do all of this before sunset. If they entered the praetorium, they would suffer ritual defilement and there'd be no chance for them to be cleansed of their defilement before eating the Hagigah. They had to eat it before sundown. So let's look at this again through a timeline. It's the top chart on page 12. Here's what that timeline uh, reads. If this is the Hagigah, then defilement is a problem because this rabbinic traditional defilement ends at sundown. The Hagigah had to be eaten before sundown. So here's our timeline. Here's the trial on the left. It's in the early morning before nine o'clock. They had to if they enter the praetorium, they would suffer defilement at the trial. Then the Hagigah, the Passover, is offered in a ritually pure state at 9 o'clock, but they would be defiled. Then they had to eat the Hagigah. They had to eat the Passover on the same day in a ritually pure state, but they, they'd been defiled. And then the defile would, defilement would not end until sunset. So, the, this... Uh, they had, to, they had to do all of this before sunset. So the point that confuses commentators is the fact that they don't realize that the Hagigah is also called the Passover. The term the Passover is applied to both sacrifices. It's applied to the offering made by the family on the 14th of Nisan. The family offering, the Pesach, is often called the Passover. However, in addition, that title is also applied to the offering made by the priests the next day on the 15th of Nisan at 9 o'clock in the morning, the Hagigah, because it was the official Passover festival peace offering, was also called the Passover. If this were a reference to the family's Passover, there'd be no problem with defilement. Why? Because the family Passover was eaten after sundown. Now, this incident occurs early in the morning, before 9 a.m. Had, had this been the family Passover, they could have entered the praetorium and suffered defilement. And they would have been cleansed of defilement at sundown, and they'd been able to eat the family Passover meal. Now, let's look at the bottom of uh, page 12 and the chart, and we'll go through this. If this is the Pesach, then defilement is not a problem because this rabbinic traditional defilement ends at sundown. And here's our timeline. So the trial is in the early morning. If they enter the praetorium, they would suffer defilement. Then in the afternoon, the late afternoon, the Pesach is offered by a designated member of the group, of the family. You know, they didn't have to, they could be defiled, but someone else could have offered the Passover for them, the Pesach, that wouldn't have been a problem. And then at sunset, defilement ends, and then they could eat the Pesach, eat the Passover. So the offering that John refers to cannot be the family Passover because there would have been an opportunity for ritual, ritual cleansing if it was. So John has been referring to the Hagigah because the priests would not have had an opportunity for ritual cleansing. So knowledge of this simple little fact of tradition solves the argument regarding when the Last Supper was eaten. Was the Passover eaten on the 14th of Nisan, Wednesday, or on the 15th of Nisan, Thursday? Well, it was eaten on the 14th of, Nasa, of Nisan, not eaten, excuse me, on the 14th, the Passover lamb was sacrificed, 14th of Nisan, then the sun set, and then the 15th of Nisan began at night, and the, the Passover was eaten on the 15th of Nisan during the family's Seder. And then the Hagigah was also offered on the 15th of Nisan at 9 o'clock in the morning. The family Seder being at night, just after the sunset, and the, on the 15th of Nisan, and the Hagigah at 9 o'clock in the morning after the sun had risen. It's really as simple as that. And uh, my sources for this information uh, are, uh, first of all, the temple, its ministry and services as they were in the time of Messiah. Uh, on page 170, you'll find this information. This is an excellent book. I think you all should have it in your library. It's by, by, our, it's by our good old friend, Dr. Alfred Edersheim.
Thank you, Dr. Edersheim. Appreciate your input so much. But you could also purchase Yeshua, the life of the Messiah from a Messianic Jewish perspective by, from Ariel Ministries. Now this book comes in a one volume abridged version, or you can buy the four volume full version. And again, an excellent, excellent resource for you to have in your library. Uh, it was written by Dr. Arnold G. Fruchtenbaum, the director of Ariel Ministries. So I recommend both of those resources very highly. All right, let's go on to page 13 and the trial begins. This is John 18, 29. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? So in accordance with Roman law, the proceedings had to begin on a specific charge voiced by the prosecuting witness. Accordingly to the plan, Judas was supposed to step forward, but Judas is very dead, so he can't do so. Verse 30, they answered and said to him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So they have no witness, they have no accuser. So they attempt to force Pilate to pass sentence apart from a witness or an accusation. Pilate, re, uh, Pilate responds in the first part of verse 31. So Pilate said to them, take him and judge him yourselves and judge him according to your law. Pilate knows Roman procedure. It's pretty obvious to him. No accusation, no condemnation, no sentencing. The Jewish leaders respond in verse 31 and 32. The Jews said to him, we are not permitted to put anyone to death to fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying what kind of death he was about to die. Now it's interesting to note that the Talmud tells exactly at what, what point the Roman government took away from the Sanhedrin the power of capital punishment. It's dated at 40 years before the destruction of the temple. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, minus 40 years, and you come to 30 AD, the very year of this trial. The year of this trial, the authority for the capital punishment was taken away from the Sanhedrin. And here are some Talmudic insights. Here is the um, Encyclopedia Judaica. The article is Capital Punishment, and page 447 of volume four, we read, the right of imposing capital punishment having been taken from the Sanhedrin by the Romans 40 years before the destruction of the temple. That's found in the Sanhedrin 41a, in the Talmud of Jerusalem, Sanhedrin 118a. So uh, another source of this material that I use is my Sanchino Classics collection on CD there, the Sanchino Talmud. So that's another good resource I would encourage you to buy. So the Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin 41a. And it has, been also, and has also been taught 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the Sanhedrin were exiled from the Hall of Hewn Stones and they did not try capital charges. Capital charges could be tried only in the chief seat of the Sanhedrin, the Hall of Hewn Stones. And from the Jerusalem Talmud, uh, this particular edition translated by Rabbi Jacob Neusner, a prolific Jewish writer, Sanhedrin 118a, Jerusalem Talmud. It was taught 40 years before the destruction of the temple, the right to judge capital cases was withdrawn. Now we know exactly where the Hall of Hewn Stones was located. This is the floor plan of Herod's temple, and we know that this is the Hall of Hewn Stones right here. We know where that's where the trial legally was supposed to be held. And here's a picture from the outside of the temple complex, and that particular building right there is the Hall of Hewn Stones. And they were exiled from that hall. They could not try capital cases. Now, according to John 18.32, this is in the providence of God. This is the way God made sure that Yeshua dies in the manner that he said he would die, which is by crucifixion. If the Sanhedrin had retained their power of the death penalty, they, would not have they wouldn't have crucified, crucified anyone. Crucifixion was not a Jewish mode of execution. So if the Sanhedrin had the power to execute, they would have stoned Yeshua to death. If, if Yeshua was stoned, there'd be no atonement. That would have violated the manner in which Jesus said he would die. That would have violated prophecy. For example, Psalm twenty-two, sixteen, 16, Messiah is speaking. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. 
So the Messiah has to be pierced in some way. And then we come to Zechariah 12.10. God is speaking. I, God, will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so they will look on me, they'll look on God, they'll look on me, whom they have pierced. Now how in the world can you pierce God? He's spirit, he's not physical. How can you do that? What is this talking about? Well, in the next uh, part of the verse, the me changes to he. And they will mourn for him, excuse me, changes to him. We're now speaking of the Messiah as one mourns for an only son, and they will, will weep bitterly over him, the Messiah, like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. And the Messiah can be pierced. Why? Because he's the God-man. He's fully God and fully man, so he can be pierced. And then Isaiah 53, 5. But he, speaking of the Messiah, and the rabbis agree in many, many cases that this is a messianic prophecy, but he, Messiah, was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed, which means a violent, severe bruising. He was crushed for our iniquity. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. So the Messiah has to be pierced, crushed, chastened, and scourged. And all of this did, in fact, happen to Yeshua. So in the very year of this trial, the very year of this trial was the very year under Jewish references that they no longer had the authority to execute anyone. This is God's providence. And this is also the fulfillment of Genesis 49.10. Another messianic prophecy, the scepter, which speaks of ruling authority. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until, until Shiloh. Now that's a rabbinic name for Messiah. Until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So the scepter has passed from Judah. The ruling authority has passed from Judah and the ruler's staff from between his feet because now the occupying power, Rome, controls the Sanhedrin and determines what they can do and what they can't do. Genesis 49.10 is fulfilled. The scepter has been passed, the scepter has departed, and the Messiah has arrived. So by being stymied by all this, they finally come up with an accusation in the Luke account, Luke 23, 2. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he, is, he himself is Messiah, is Christ, a king. Ah, an accusation is finally voiced, sedition against Rome. Pilate has to take this seriously. Now in view of an accusation that Paul Paul, that Pilate has to consider seriously, Pilate now calls for a private conference between Yeshua and himself. And here is Yeshua before Pilate for the first time. Here's their private conference, John 18, 33. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Yeshua and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Now from Pilate's viewpoint, he wants to know, are you a competitor to Caesar? Are you an insurrectionist? However, Yeshua responds in verse 34. Yeshua answered, Are you saying this of your own accord, of your own initiative, or did others tell, me, tell you about me? So Yeshua wants to know, what's the basis on which you're asking the question? From the, from the viewpoint of a Roman, are you asking on a political basis? Or from the viewpoint of a Jew, are you asking from a re religious Jewish perspective? So Yeshua is not ignorant here. He knows what's going on, but he's ministering to Pilate here. He's asking in order to get Pilate to exercise faith. Well, Pilate responds, this is the top of page 15, John 18, 35. Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and chief priests deliver you to me. What have you done? Basically, Pilate says, I'm not Jewish. I could care less about your religion. I'm interested in the political realm, the political arena. Verse 36, Yeshua answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. 
So Yeshua's answer explains the nature of the kingdom from the political perspective. He's giving Pilate the answer that Pilate is looking for. Yeshua says, no, I'm not a competitor to Caesar. Now, there are those who are amillennialists. An amillennialist, a millennialist, is someone who doesn't believe in a literal kingdom on the earth. And they like to use this verse to teach against a literal messianic kingdom, a thousand year messianic kingdom. And they say, well, Jesus said the kingdom is not of this world. What they ignore is that in John 17, Yeshua uses the very same expression for his disciples. To say something is not of this world is not to say that it will not be in the world. And this comes out clearly in John 17 when Yeshua, when Yeshua says to his disciples in verse 16, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. So they're both in the world, both Jesus and the disciples are in the world, but they're not of the world. John 17, 16 means that they are not of the world's nature. The kingdom of Messiah will be in the world, but it's not going to be of the world in nature. Now, because of the rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus, his kingdom, his messianic kingdom, the thousand year messianic kingdom will not be set up at this point. In its place will be the mystery form of the kingdom. Now, what is the mystery form of the kingdom? Let me give you a definition of the mystery form of the kingdom. During the mystery form of the kingdom, the king is absent, but he's ruling in the hearts of his followers through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay, the king is absent, but ruling in his followers. So the kingdom is not of this world. It's not of the world's nature. It's a very different type of kingdom. Let's move on to verse 37. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? Pilate didn't hear the truth. He didn't hear, he didn't understand. He didn't hear the voice of Yeshua. Oh yeah, he heard it physically, but he didn't understand it. Pilate said to him, what? is truth. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. So Pilate asked, are you a king in any sense of the term? And Yeshua answered, yeah, I'm a king of the truth. And then cynical, sarcastic Pilate answers, what is truth? And the irony, the irony is that he looked at truth eye to eye. He looked at truth square in the face and he didn't recognize him. Now, the result of this conference is the first declaration of innocence. So you're in the top of page 16 right now. Luke 24, 23, 4. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and crowds, I find no guilt in this man. He's not a competitor to Caesar. There's no threat to Rome. Mark 15, 3. And the chief priests began to accuse him harshly. So more accusations follow. And the response of Yeshua is silence. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. So Pilate asked for a response, Mark 15, four and five. Then Pilate questioned him again saying, do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Yeshua may know for their answer. So Pilate was amazed. So still there's no answer. There's no need for an answer. He's been declared innocent. He should be immediately released. There's no need to comment anymore. So Pilate breaks Roman, Roman law right here. He should have released him. Now amidst the accusation, someone finally mentions that Yeshua originates in Galilee, Luke 23, 5. But they kept on insisting, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. Aha. This gives Pilate the opportunity to get off the hook, if only briefly. Well, why? <laughs> well, Herod Antipas is in Jerusalem. Herod is in Jerusalem for Passover. Galilee is not under the jurisdiction of Pontius Pilate. It's under the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. So Pilate sends Yeshua to Herod for trial. All right, we're gonna pause here for just a moment and consider some thoughts of application. 
So the theme I chose for this application is the theme, Standing for the Truth. Standing for the Truth. And the biblical material, the biblical application, Peter, he denied Yeshua. He was not standing for the truth. He caved in. Secondly, the religious leaders holding a kangaroo court, they weren't standing for the truth. They were pure evil. The Judas, he committed suicide because he couldn't bear the truth about what he'd done. Pilate, he declared the truth, but he didn't stand for it. Jesus was declared innocent. He should have released him. In contrast, we see Yeshua simply straightforwardly, with dignity, stating the truth and standing in it. So let's get personal now. Let's use Yeshua as our example. And when we're put in a tough situation, let's simply state the truth with dignity and stand firm on that statement. Are you facing a situation in your life where it would be difficult to state and stand in the truth? Write that situation down as your personal application. Perhaps you're not in that kind of a situation today. I suggest that you purpose to tell the truth in the future, no matter how difficult it may be. Just write that down. I purpose to stand in the truth. Then let's move on from a personal application to a plan of action. Write down something practical you could do in order to implement your application. Standing in the truth can be very difficult when you're part of a society that's smothered, drowning in lies. Stand for the truth. All right, lesson 14, page 18, section 234, the second Roman trial, this time before Herod Antipas. Now, Herod Antipas is the son of Herod the Great, and he's the murderer of John the Baptist. So we pick it up in Luke 23, 5. But they kept on insisting, saying, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee and even as far as this place. And when Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And, he, and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at that time. So here we go from the Antonio Fortress. Yeshua is taken up to the Western Hill and to the palace of Herod, Herod's palace, right there in the Western Hill. And here's how the territory looks again from uh, today, from the Antonio Fortress, and then a Trudge, trudge up the hill, up the western hill to Herod's palace. And then another view, a three-quarter view from the Antonio Fortress up the hill to Herod's palace. And so we finally arrived at Herod's palace, haven't we? Herod's palace is in the foreground, a sumptuous palace built for his personal use. You can see it's on top of the hill, looking down the hill into the valley, and there is the Temple Mount itself. Now here's that uh, Jerusalem model, and here is uh, the, the uh, Antonio Fortress in the background, and in the foreground we have Herod's palace, sumptuous palace. And here's another picture of the model. It must have been quite a place. Now, what Herod wants Yeshua to do is some magic tricks for him. Luke 23, 8 and 9. Now Herod was very glad when he saw Yeshua, for he had wanted to see him for a long time, because he had been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. And he questioned him at some length, but he answered him nothing. So Jesus answered nothing to his many, many questions. Verse 10. And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently. So Yeshua's accusers have followed him to Herod's palace, and the chief priests and scribes stand fiercely, fiercely accusing him. Then when Yeshua won't perform any magic tricks for Herod, verse 11, and Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. When Yeshua won't, resp won't respond, it leads to mockery by Herod's soldiers. This is the, uh, another mockery Yeshua suffers. This is again the second stage of the civil trial. So the second stage of the civil trial is going to lead to a second declaration of innocence. He's sent back to Pilate. 
Now, an interesting result of this trial comes in verse 12. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for they had been enemies with each other. Herod and Pilate become buddies. Now there's a sort the source of enmity between Pilate and and uh, Herod Antipas arises out of the fact that Pilate first became procurator when he first became procurator he erected the Roman shield Roman shields in the temple and that's in violation of Jewish law which did not allow images on the temple precinct so this action uh, occasioned a riot therefore Herod Antipas sent a letter of complaint to Caesar Tiberius and Tiberius ordered the shields removed and and after that incident and because of that incident Herod Antipas and Pilate were in a state of and of hostility toward each other but as a result of this trial of Messiah and because Pilate had sent Yeshua to Herod therefore recognizing Herod's authority over Galilee the antagonism ceases and they're now great friends now nine years later in the year 39 AD Herod Antipas instigated by Herodias who also instigated him to kill John the Baptist, Herodias indicates him to go back to Rome and seek the title of king. When he arrived in Rome, he was deposed by Emperor Caligula. <laughs> Caligula didn't think much of this idea, and then banished by the Roman Senate to Lyon, which is in present-day France. There he died in poverty. So Pontius Pilate paid dearly for his role in the death of John the Baptist, excuse me, Herod Antipas, Herod Antipas, paid dearly for his, his role in the death of John the Baptist and his mockery of Yeshua. You see, the mills of God may grind slowly, but the mills of God grind very, very fine. All right, lesson 14, page 19, word section 235. This is the third Roman trial back before Pilate. So there's a return to the Praetorium. They're in Herod's palace. Now they return back to the Antonio Fortress, the Praetorium. Now, in the last stage of the civil trial, there are going to be several attempts by Pilate to have the Messiah released. So we begin in Luke 23, 13 through 15, with attempt number one. Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers and the people. And he said to them, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. Nor, no, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us. And behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. So this is the third declaration of innocence and the first attempt to have Yeshua released. Pilate presents Yeshua before the people and he points out that Herod Antipas didn't find any basis of conviction and neither does he. So the charge is, is political, it's inciting rebellion. And the result is this third declaration of, in of innocence. It fails. This third, this, uh, this uh, charge of inciting rebellion fails. Now we come to attempt number two to have Yeshua released. He's gonna, Pilate's going to do this by offering the people a substitute, a choice between Jesus and Barabbas. John 18, 39. But you have a custom that I release someone, someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again saying, no, not this man, but Barabbas. And now Barabbas was a robber. Now who Barabbas is comes out in Luke 23, 19 as well. He's a robber. And then in verse 19 of Luke 23, he was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city and for murder. So note, Note the irony here. Barabbas is guilty of the very crime Yeshua is being accused of. And this is at the civil trial. Sedition against Rome, inciting rebellion, ins insurrection. But the irony goes even further. We know from secular sources that the full name of Barabbas was Jesus Barabbas, which means Jesus, son of the Father. The one with this name is guilty while the true son of the father is innocent. The guilty one will be released. The innocent one will be executed. Now, just before the choice is brought to the people, Pilate gets a message from his wife, verse 19. 
While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Now Pilate gets sufficient warning that he must not act out the role of a judge to the point of sentencing Messiah to death. And God even sends a nightmare. He, God sends a nightmare to Pilate's wife. This is God extending his mercy toward Pilate. Now, according to tradition, the wife's name was Claudia, and she's in the position of influence. If anyone is going to influence Pilate, it's going to be her. However, he doesn't listen to her influence. He proceeds to offer the choice, in spite of his affirmation of innocence as well. And now on page 20 of your of your outline, Matthew 27, 20. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and put Yeshua to death. But the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. So the offer of a choice fails because the multitude chooses Barabbas. Pilate doesn't want to release a true insurrectionist. Yeshua is harmless. Barabbas is not. Barabbas is dangerous. So his attempt to set free a harmless, innocent man through this strategy fails. When this attempt to have Messiah released fails by offering the people a choice, Pilate now makes a third attempt to have Yeshua released by trying to offer a compromise, John 19, 1. Pilate then took Yeshua and scourged him. Having Yeshua scourged was his plan probably, probably um, playing on the emotions of the people. Scourging entail, entailed a very, very cruel form of punishment. It involved a whip containing a number of lashes. The lashes were leather strips with a piece of metal glass or nails embedded in the strips. And with the lashes, the skin would tear away of the flesh and the bones. The flesh and the bones would be exposed. Now here's some diagrams. There'll be some diagrams on page 22 for you to look at. But scourging, under the Roman method, the victim was stripped, stretched on a frame, and beaten with rods. Or the scourge consisted of a handle with three lashes attached, sometimes with pieces of metal fastened to them. And here's a diagram of the scourging. There's the diagram. Here in the center we have the victim attached to this post. And then beside him we have a couple of Roman soldiers with the scourge, laying the scourge on the victim's back. And here's another depiction of the scourging. Now this would be before the first two lashes uh, struck Yeshua's back because Yeshua is undamaged there. There's no blood, there's no rips in his flesh. They're just about ready to start the first blows. Now, I'm not trying to be spectacular, sensational here, but this picture portrays what would be a more real, realistic uh, condition that Yeshua was in at the end of the scourging. Now, this portrayal probably isn't gruesome enough, but I'm not trying to be spectacular with it. I'm just trying to give you an idea of what his body truly looked like when the scourging was over. Now, we're at the top of page 21. Now many died because of the scourging before they were ever crucified. Now at the end of the lashing, his body had been torn, including his face. And this is the fulfillment of Isaiah 52, 13 through 15. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Now here's again a portrayal of Yeshua on the cross. But again, this portrayal far, falls far short of what, what actually happened. Now this is a gruesome, some gruesome injuries to this actor's face. But the scripture says his face was so marred and disfigured it no longer resembled a man. Yeshua looked like hamburger when they got done with him. John 14, 2. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a purple robe on him. So now we have another mockery. A crown is placed on his head and pressed into his flesh, causing further bleeding down his face. And there's a great amount of symbolism here. 
In Genesis 3, the thorns are a symbol of the curse. Messiah bearing the crown of thorns is a picture of Messiah in his suffering bearing the curse of, for sin. And then he, he was dressed in a robe. The robe is a single symbol of kingship. Here we have the king of kings bearing humanity's sins. John 19, 3. And they began to come up to him and say, Hail, king of the Jews! And they gave him slaps on the face. So they mocked the charge of kingship. The irony is that someday every Jew and Gentile will hail him as Messiah and king. They struck him with their hands. This is the fourth case of mistreatment that morning. Following the scourging, there's a fourth declaration of innocence. This is Pilate's attempt at a compromise. John 19, 4 and 5. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I bring him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to him, Behold the man. And here's that very famous picture, Behold the man. The idea here is he's innocent, but I've beaten him up really badly. Is that good enough for you? Isn't that a good enough punishment? But this attempt also fails because the response of the multitude is to demand crucifixion. Now, of course, in this picture, here is Yeshua. But please notice, the artist did not have the heart to draw Yeshua with a flayed body. You see in this picture, Yeshua's body is flawless. There's no damage done to it. And so it's an ina inaccurate picture in that sense, but I would say it probably views the, the um, sentiments of the artist. And there's another interesting part of this picture that I'd like you to note here in this circle. Guess who this is? Who do you think that is? Well, I think that's Pilate's wife. Remember, she came to him with a message, have nothing to do with that righteous man. Well, here Pilate has ignored her and she's turning away in grief. I think it's a pretty neat picture, pretty neat picture. All right, now we move to John 19, verse 6. So when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify, crucify. They demand crucifixion. So Pilate now refuses to give sentence, page 23. This is his fourth attempt to have Messiah released. He refuses to give the Roman sentence, verse 6. Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. This tactic finally works. They can't crucify him. The crowd can't crucify him. The religious leaders can't crucify him. So this stops the accusers cold for a moment, just for a moment. Thwarted momentarily, they finally come up with the real charge that's bothering them. Verse 7, the Jews answered him, and the Jews answered him, we have a law. And by that law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the son of God. Now, the real charge is not inciting rebellion. It's not sedition. The real charge is the claim to Messiahship. Verse 8. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Yeshua, Where are you from? And Yeshua gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you do, not, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? This shakes Pilate, this charge shakes Pilate and it leads to a second private interview, a second pri private hearing with Yeshua. In this interview, Yeshua, excuse me, Jesus will answer no more questions. In his, in his exasperation, Pilate asks if Jesus recognizes that he has power to release Yeshua, power to put him to death, power to crucify him. To which Jesus tells him who really is in control. Verse 11, Yeshua answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. So whatever power Pilate has is by divine permission. Everyone in a position of authority is put there by God. That's the teaching of the book of Daniel and Romans 13, for example. Here, Daniel 2.21. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. So God's in charge. Romans 13.1. 
Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So even evil rulers are put there by God. So as a result, he that delivers me, that's the leadership of Israel, has the greater sin. But note, Pilate bears plenty of sin too. Now we're at page 24 in your outline. And this leads to a fifth attempt by Pilate to have Yeshua released. And in fact, a number of unspecified attempts in verse 12. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts, a number of them, efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out saying, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. So Pilate is thwarted by the cries of Israel. You are not Caesar's friend. And this one statement causes Pilate to act. Verse 13. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Yeshua out and sat down in the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now, page 25, by the way, of your outline. Why should this one statement shake him in this manner? The reason? Pilate got his procuratorship from a friend who had authority in Rome. The friend was Sejanus, Lucius alias Sejanus. Around the same period of time that Pilate became procurator, Sejanus had been accused of treason and executed in Rome. So now everyone who has any connection with Sejanus is under investigation by the Roman Senate to see what role they might have played in the plot formulated by Sejanus. And because of his friendship with Sejanus, Pilate is under investigation by Rome. The last thing that he needed was for Rome to hear that someone claiming to be a king of the Jews and hence a competitor to Caesar had been released by Pilate. Therefore, it is at this point that Pilate sits himself on the judgment seat. And we finally come to the final attempt to have Jesus released when he states, Behold your king, in verse 14. It was now the day of preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold your king. Was he trying to insult them or shame them? Let's move on to verse 15. So they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now, the very ones who tried to entrap Yeshua with the question as to whether it's lawful to pay tribute to Rome and own Caesar as king, now they themselves reject the Jewish king and they accept the Gentile one and they own Caesar as king. Now Pilate likes this. He can report that he got the Jewish leadership to pledge allegiance to Rome. Matthew 27, 24. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See that, see to that yourselves. So the fifth and most strategic declaration of innocence is coming right from the judgment seat. Now, although Pilate may think he's washing his hands of the matter, he's far from innocent. He alone had the power to sentence a person to death or to release him. Pilate's washing his hands can, under no circumstance, alleviate the role he played in the death of Messiah. He's the one who will pass sentence. He's the one who will assign Roman soldiers to crucify him. And cleansing your hands here is a Jewish custom, not a Roman custom. For example, Deuteronomy 21.6. All the elders of the city, which is nearest to the slain man, shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. And this is a declaration of innocence by the elders of that city. They found a, a man slain in a valley. Nobody knows who did it. So they come out, they go through this ritual, and washing their hands basically is a, a statement of innocence. We're innocents of this man's uh, killing. And the same in Psalm 73, 13. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure, washed my hands in innocence. And then Psalm 26, 6. I shall wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, O Lord. So this is a declaration of innocence. But washing his hands is a futile gesture. Pilate's role is not forgotten in the book of Acts, Acts 3, 4, and 13. 
The church hasn't forgotten. In the Apostles' Creed, we read, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. And an example is Acts 4.27. For truly in this city, there was gathered together against your holy servant Yeshua, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Now in the year 36 AD, Pilate was banished to Gaul by Emperor Caligula. There he committed suicide and he paid for his role in the death of Messiah. He took Yeshua's life, he also took his own life. Now, of his being innocent of the blood of this righteous man, which he is not, the leadership of Israel responds in verse 25 of Matthew 27. And all the people said, his blood shall be on us and our children. So they take upon themselves the responsibility for the murder. They take upon themselves the responsibility for the violent death, and they apply it to them and their children. However, it doesn't go beyond that. Anti-Semites like to make this perpetual, but the Jewish people on a whole today cannot be held accountable for his death. In 70 AD, the curse, the, the consequences will come upon them and their children, and that ends it. It does not continue to any subsequent Jewish generation. It ended at 70 AD. That was the punishment of the unpardonable sin. Luke 23, 24 and 25. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. And he released the man they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. But he delivered Yeshua to their will. So Messiah is sentenced to death. And Pilate has the authority to pass sentence. And so he does. He condemns the innocent and he releases Barabbas. And here's an illustration of the sentencing. Here's Yeshua on the left side, who is innocent, and Barabbas on the right side, who is guilty. And there's symbolic substitution right here. Here, Yeshua, the real son of the Father, will die in place of the one who is only, who is only called Yeshua, son of the Father. The innocent and genuine Yeshua, son of the Father, will die in place of the guilty and fake Yeshua son of the Father. So the picture of the substitutionary atonement of Yeshua. All right, section 236, the mockery by the Roman soldiers. Mark 15, 16 through 19. And the soldiers took him away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and they called together the whole Roman cohort, and they dressed him up in purple, and after twisting a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to acclaim him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they began beating his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling and bowing before him. So the soldiers lead him away within the court, which is called the Praetorium. And they gathered together the cohort that had earlier arrested Yeshua. And so Yeshua suffers the fourth mockery and the fifth mistreatment of his arrest and trial. The mockery, Hail, King of the Jews! The mistreatment, they smote his head with a reed, spit on him, bowing their knees, they worshiped him. So he's verbally mocked and physically beaten. And the reed here, the reed is a mock scepter. The scepter is a symbol of authority. All right, let's close this um, lesson by jumping ahead a couple pages to page 29 and the application. We'll cover those other pages next, next session. But for now, let's move on to our application. And the theme I chose for the application is how to handle responsibility. Now, Pilate, the responsibility to do what was right in the trial of Jesus rested on his shoulders. He, however, considered that pleasing the multitude and not risking his position more important than his responsibility to do what was right, to release Yeshua. As a result, he made a feeble gesture to wash his hands of the responsibility that was his. Pilate could not escape the consequences of rejecting his responsibilities, and neither will we. The religious leaders, in contrast, the re religious leaders foolishly accepted the responsibility for their evil actions. Instead of doing what was right and accepting the responsibility for it, they did what was wrong and cried for the consequences to come upon them. Obviously, they did a very foolish thing. They did not really believe they would, that they would have to bear the consequences of their evil actions. They didn't really believe it. 
However, they didn't escape their responsibility and the consequences came on them and their children in 70 AD. Now, let's go to a personal application. You know, we're no different from Pilate or the religious leaders. Often people put personal concerns and comfort before responsibility. Often we do sinful things thinking that the consequences will never catch up to us. But in both cases, we're mistaken. We cannot avoid our responsibilities. We should face them, do what is right, and stand by that decision no matter how difficult it seems. Let us not be like Pilate or the priests. Now, is there some responsibility in your life that you've been avoiding, washing your hands of it, so to speak? Write it down, write it down. Are you being tempted to do or have you done something that you know is wrong, but you're hoping you will get away with it and avoid the responsibility and the consequences? Write that item down. And now let's move to a plan of action. Write down something practical you can do to respond to your application. All right, well, I see I'm out of time. We'll pick it up next session at page 27 and section 237 as we now begin the journey to Golgotha. The trials are over. We now begin the journey to Golgotha. So thanks for being our students. Thanks for being our students. We hope this lesson has been meaningful to you and caused you to fall, fall more in love with Jesus, Jesus, our Messiah. Thanks for being our students. We'll see you next session. Lehitra Oat. Lehitra Oat.